And Kairut said, could a real revolutionist use the idea of having a house that seemed almost unlived in internally? He himself leaving almost no trace of himself in himself. And Kairut said, with ordinary 3D consciousness, you can never measure the infinite or the too vague. And Kairut said, sign in the city, dozen roses, 595 or 995. And a guy asked the difference, $4 a dozen, his reply. <laughs> yeah, I know that, but what's the difference in the roses? None comes the reply. Same roses, it's just that you can either pay $5.95 or $9.95. As I've said before, if not five, there may be hope for the city yet. And Kyra said, I heard that one city organization had as its motto the following, help for the living, hope for the dead. <laughs> I think I'll withhold comment until someone reverses this credo. And Kairut said, <laughs> And Kairut said, Everything that most people do is just an excuse. And Kairut said, Anyone in the city who seriously proclaims how impressed they are with the intelligence of some other cityite is, if I may return a phrase, pretty, pretty easily M. Dam pressed. <laughs> and Kyrie said, the 11th commandment of the bushes, don't be wasteful. Even should your efforts seem useless or unnecessary, don't be wasteful. And Kyrie said, recently read in a city book that one big vice in a man is apt to keep out many smaller ones. But how about this? Big, I mean really big vices, may just keep a man from noticing lesser ones. For instance, who today remembers Attila's terrible habit of interrupting other people's conversations? <laughs> Said. <laughs> and Kairut said, should you prefer to be met by a friendly experience or a hostile theory? Too easy? Okay, try it this way. Would you prefer to dance with an adversarial theory or a pleasing experience? Call me nothing if not agreeable, flexible, and not after 11 p.m. <laughs> and Kyrie said, I'll never trust another Robin as long as I live, cried a man simply desperate for suffering and disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> and Kyrie said, a certain city intelligentsia overheard rebuffing his scion, if the golden age of Greece were alive today, what would it have to say about you? And Kyra said, any particular goods are not really your hobby if, by once possessing them, they lose their value and desirability. And Kyra said, Twas once said that only on the edge of the grave can a man become conclusive. But I say, only on the edge of conclusion does a man become grave. <laughs> and Kyrie said, one city guy was always saying, they should put me in the book, they should put me in the book. And finally his wife and some of his friends pointed out that there was no book about guys like him, so then he began to always be saying, they should write the book, they should write the book. <laughs> and Kyrie said, if questioned on the matter, even superficially, do you believe that anybody would claim to have meant everything they ever said? 
And Kyrut said, there is a certain phenomenon that cosmologists and others have yet to discover in city affairs, which is that some things which appear retreating are, in fact, advancing. And Kyrut said, never trust a god with call holding. <laughs> <laughs> and Kyrut said, one old city guy said, life ain't nothing but chaos put in numerical order. <laughs> and Kyrut said, one city scientist recently stated, what's scary is that theoretically your genetic makeup knows everything and feels everything that all of humanity has ever gone through. And a revolutionist thought, theoretically, indeed. <laughs> and Kyrut added, theoretically, the supreme adverbial cop-out. <laughs> and Kyrut said, when the final history of man is writ, there'll be a lot. And Kyrut said, when the final history of man is writ, there'll be a lot of explaining to do. <laughs> If you may have noted, periodically, I seem want to try and give some indication regarding why, how, to what end I continue to drag up and pull in new areas of life out there to use metaphorically, politics, economics, animal husbandry perhaps someday. <laughs> but has anyone ever considered this? For me to attempt to do that, if it were possible, then I wouldn't have to speak metaphorically to start with. Uh-oh. What does this pretend? Even portend for the rest of the night. I wanted to say a few things about what seems to be kinds of metaphorical structures. I have read, and surely you have, numerous times throughout history, something to this effect, all the way up until last week, I'm sure, that somebody will write that man is engaged or should be engaged in a search for the possible connections between his, nowadays they'll say things like, to search for a possible connection between his unconscious mind and his external structures and institutions, his dreams, his art, his architecture. Now I would like to be able to relieve you, if any of you have thought of that, of some pressure. To begin with, there is no search and there is no problem, there's no need for you to consider the possible connections because they're not possible, they're just right there. And a little bit further, even though I have said for my own purposes at the time, I'm trying to drag you a little further tonight, even though I have said things along this similar line, let me now try and disavow you completely of the idea that there might be some connection between a man's internal state and what's out there, that there could be some possible link between the internal affairs of a single person, an individual person, and then what appears to be the collective, the racial of man, the race of man, of these external affairs. It is not that there is sort of a connection. It is, it is not that it is kind of a reflection. It's not, it's not sort of and it's not kind of. It is. But the reality of it being is, is one reason that using words, you, I and anyone else that even saw anything outside the binary basis of the city have to go back to what appears to be metaphorical descriptions. Because what seems to be a man's inner life 
is absolutely what seems to be the external life of all men. But there is nothing in the genetic code of life coming out through man to make it possible for that to be seen. And so then you have to take what, if, from one view, is a straight, now I'm using metaphor, of course, you have to take a straight little piece of wire and you have to bend it up and then talk to people about, imagine if this piece of wire was straight. And everybody goes, all right, let's see. <laughs> and when that, when that gets old, people get used to that. I have to put it away and I pull it back out, maybe another hand or I paint it green. I say, look at this little piece of rolled up twisted wire. This is the way that life has made this wire. But now, follow me, I want you to imagine. You'll see why in a moment, I think. I want you to imagine this little piece of wire is straight. <laughs> there is no slight connection between what you are individually and what everything is out there. This has been played with I'm not here to give history lessons, but surely enough of you are read enough. This has been played with everywhere from Greek philosophers to would-be Judaic mystics. But it's always been on a basis that maybe, or that in some afterlife, in some other life, or that metaphorically, the affairs of man out here, the history of some group of people, of some religion, some nationality, or of all men, which life hadn't gotten that far yet, but that there is possibly a lesson to be learned that this could be some sort of reflection, some sort of, what should we say, a living metaphor for the individuals. And it's no such thing. It's not a metaphor. It's not kind of a reflection. It's not sort of like. It's exactly like. Exactly like. All right, some of you here are laughing, and I hear a few people, at least on the West Coast, chuckling. But why are you chuckling? If you're chuckling, really. Now, if you're really chuckling, of course, you're having a good night. Because you're, you're somewhere above city consciousness. But there's no way to ordinarily see that everything in me, now I'm going to say everything in me, I'm using you as being someone properly to this born. That is, that you're in the right line of life's mutant genes wherein you are what I used to describe, that you have the wiring potential to be almost everybody, that you have, as everybody does, but you have the history of man in your genes, in your nervous system, and you have the potential to almost read it. At least when I seem to be reading it, you can almost hear it and other people can't. You've got to have that potential, and to have that potential and then begin to execute it all is to see that everything that happens in you happens out there, not sort of, not kind of, not metaphorically. It does. Anything you want to name, a symphony orchestra happens in you. Governments happen in you. Monarchies happen in you. Democracies happen in you. This is another little small piece of a, or perhaps the tricky trick, that in the city there's really no subtle shadings and shifts that things are either seen as being what they are or then the only alternative is, all right, you're speaking metaphorically. And there are no subtle shifts. But part of city Consciousness, part of the trick that life has used in city consciousness is to make the obvious appear to be obscure and then to make the inspecific appear to be blatant. But no graduation, no subtlety between the two. And therefore, a person is apparently either speaking about something quite concrete, we're speaking about a fan, more specifically about small electrical motors is what I'm going to talk about tonight. But staying here in this fan and me being cool, it sort of makes me think that a fan, I'm going to get to showing you, teaching about the small electrical motor, that's what you came here for, but you know a fan, people don't pay attention to some of our modern appliances, a fan is sort of like a friend. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. 
So even someone teaching at an area tech school can lapse into what appears to be some little moment of metaphor that we just we take appliances for granted, but a fan is sort of like a friend, cool you off, blah, blah, blah. I wouldn't waste my time to speak just of a fan, even though I made up the little scene there. You'd have to start getting into technology to take a wider area. You have to get into the use of electricity, the appearance of electricity, the existence of electricity, then the execution of man apparently using electricity. That is not a metaphor for what goes on in the human nervous system. That is the human nervous system. Now for the year or so that I have been using the revolution, as I called it, as a metaphor apparently, and drawing pictures of man's internal state as being likened to a real state and the bushy area as opposed to the city area wherein everybody is more or less in the same condition and everybody is born into city state of consciousness. And then we talk about forms of government and then what appears to be the struggle for power out there in the world and then what appears to be in here. And that sometimes it seems so neat that I can start talking about history, the makeup, the movement of political powers out here in the struggle and then suddenly say, ah, now look inside and I start talking about the way you try and make decisions, and sometimes you go, ah, and people will write down, that's weird. He just flipped it right in there, and it's true. It's almost the same thing. It ain't almost the same thing. It is the same thing. It's the same thing. And since it's the same thing, nobody can see it. And so then you've got to talk about, well, it's sort of the same thing. Do you realize that people could see directly, when you looked under M's in a good dictionary, you could look forever, and you'd never find the word metaphor. You can look under peas, and you might find parabellum, parboiled, but you would never find parable. There would be no such thing if you simply saw what is the point of having a metaphor, and you say, well, all right, the struggle that people do out here, like the battle between the sexes, is almost like an internal battle between people's desire to be dominant and passive. That's metaphorical. It's not metaphorical. It's not metaphorical at all. And that's why it must appear to be metaphorical at best, because people cannot see it directly. <laughs> a part of what life has done is a kind of progress, in a sense. I can see it. I'm not going to try and go into it. But uh, coming into the 20th century, the way it's now taken is it's wired into most nervous systems as being a fact, that is, the unconscious mind, individually, and then this idea of some great pool of an unconscious mind, that there has got to be everything from paintings, that you look at paintings by clay or anybody, and you look at painting, even hear music, read a book, read Moby Dick, <laughs> and there is this feeling and it's talked about, it is taught, it is analyzed, people get their PhDs in related areas of this, that everything that men do, especially creatively, and then even scientifically, especially creatively, let's start there, that seems to be the most metaphorical, that a man's unconscious mind, even a child perhaps scribbling, or people that wake up in a lab, they're doing some tests, and they say, quick, draw your dream, and they draw something crude of a guy with three hats on his head and at one hand sucking a well and a foot off the ground. And the person says, I think that's what I was, I think that's what I was dreaming, something like that. I don't know what it means. And the psychiatrist says, don't worry, don't worry. Take him, go give him something to eat. And then they sit and they ponder it. That it has perhaps some significance that this, it is some kind of reflection of a man's unconsciousness. It's no such thing. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. There it is. There's nothing to analyze. Except then you can end up getting a teaching position, if not a reputation, on the basis not of just one analyzing of one drawing of a guy's dream, but a series, 10 or 20, write a book, do a good paper. The attempted analyzation of what people say under the effects of hypnosis, what people say under the effects of alcohol, give them a little dope, and then ask people, read the Old Testament backwards. Draw what you think God would look like. Draw what you think you looked like before you were born. Draw what you think you dream when you're asleep. 
All right. It is oftentimes thought of as some kind of unconscious symbolism that comes out. That what that people say things and they say, wait a minute, I didn't mean to say that. Oftentimes known as Freudian slips. And they say, this is some, there is a connection somewhere, if we could just grasp it, that's telling us something about ourselves. There's nothing to grasp. That is, there's nothing to look for to say, all right, if we studied this, perhaps we could find what, what this indicates. It indicates what it is. There is nowhere else to look. But note, if you begin to get any feeling in of you about the general purpose that humanity is serving here, then you understand that I don't just make up this idea of talking about life misdirecting, you're talking about one thing and actually doing something else. You begin to feel it yourself, you begin to understand it, that the most common use that I can describe that life makes of this kind of misdirection is like any good con game. We don't have time tonight for me to go into con games, but any of you have ever thought about con games just out in the city? The great con games, the good ones, the historic ones, the grand ones, any good con game, all of them have one common denominator, if you don't know it, and that is they are as crude as dirt. <laughs> all good con games are crude. Anytime you see a movie like The Sting, if I remember it correctly, anything that's going to, you know, the Hollywood or somebody's going to write about it's going to take a long time and a whole lot of people and they have to misdirect a whole bunch of people like a magician on a stage and he, this one bit he's going to do, this one illusion is going to take him 20 minutes, he's got to have 10 assistants and he keeps pointing over here and make you look there and then he's doing something over here. A good one, he comes out and he says, all right, here's what I'm going to do is over here and he does the pickle right then. He says, I'm going to do this, watch that and you look and he does the trick right then, he sets it up, and he goes over and he does it, and it blows your mind to where you go, what, well, how do you do that? Any good con game is just crude as hell. Trust me, someday if we've got more time, I can give you some great examples if you don't know any. But they are crude, crude, crude. The people involved may be dressed up in thousand dollar suits, they may speak three or four languages, they may have all kinds of international connections, they may be able to hobnob with royalty, but if they're con men, whatever the con is, is just as crude as duck shit. There is nothing complicated about it, never. All right, what I, that's the kind of feeling you're gonna start getting about life, that here is a great example, if you remember how I was, that the, there is no possible slight connection between a man's internal state of consciousness and how you seem to be driven. There's no slight connection. There's no possible nexus between that and man's external life, his civilization, his culture. They're the same thing. So notice the crude con job, the great con job. Since they are the same thing, then people are led to believe that there might be some metaphorical connection. You don't see? It's not like you had that life put humanity through three or four steps of saying, all right, now trust me on this, and they give you one little story, and you go, okay, and it moves you over here, and it says, all right, now wait a minute. Now from here, you gotta consider this, and you do that. It's not that. It's almost, it's not quite this simple, but it's almost in this kind of sense that it takes heads and turns over and makes it tails. It turns up into down. It makes it appear that there might be a metaphorical connection between the internal life of man and what appears to be the kind of structures, institutions, civilizations, cultures that he seems to have established outside of himself, collectively. There seems to be, there seems to be good evidence. There seems to be a feel that there must be. Religions talk about it. Philosophies talk about it. Everyday people talk about it. That, yeah, you're right. In a sense, a fan is like a good friend. Ha, 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 I never thought of that. Nothing is like anything else. Everything is everything else. But as long as you can't see that, as long as you can't see that, then, of course, there'll always be a job description and some money to be made by who? Priests, rabbis, ministers, philosophers, anybody that apparently will grab somebody else and say, come here, baby, let's dance. Because a dance is a metaphor. And there you are while you're going backwards, they're picking your pocket. I don't mean that necessarily literally, because that's no great 
but they are mugging you without a gun, telling you jokes, whispering in your ear, saying, my, what a dancer you are. Have you ever noticed that a dance is kind of like life? Have you ever noticed that a dance floor is somewhat like a government in transition? <laughs> and the right people go, no, I hadn't, but go on. I, I hear where you're going. Where are you going? There's nowhere to go except around and around. There's nowhere to go except to look off. The obvious must become obscure while appearing that we're getting somewhere in the city. People want to study parables. Their whole books are parables. Study parables because there were great men somewhere in the past. Driven men, cosmic men, that saw life as some sort of metaphor. That life is like a baseball game. Life is a baseball game. It's not like. <laughs> every mood, every fear in man, every piece of architecture and every institution are all planned by, fueled by life's own genetic schemes. All of it. And Let's assume that even the last few minutes and before these other few minutes are up, that some of you here, and maybe hearing this on tape, actually feel, get a glimpse of, and are feel that, hey, that's true, that's true, that's true. But then notice, it's very fleeting as always. There is nothing in your natural genetic makeup in the human brain, no matter how intelligent you are, no matter how educated you are here, there's nothing there to hold that. It is like pouring water in a sieve, and it's almost as though us sitting here together, that in some way I can put on some coat of Teflon or some flour, and you can almost hold it for a few seconds, and then it goes right through and it's gone. That all right, there's got to be some difference, though. That what goes on out here, the world of environment, the world that men have created. We were not born with skyscrapers, the internal combustion engine, uh, polycarbons, fluorides. We were not born with this. We were born in some pristine state when we were healthy. We were close to God, and some men love to be 25 and 26 <laughs> years old. We were not born in this unnatural condition. This is the city, of course, talking. This is common, this is conventional wisdom of the city nowadays, that men have created all of these adverse conditions out there. Now, of course, we could see some of these adverse conditions. The pollution of our environment, there's no doubt we could see that almost as a metaphor. Sad to say, is the pollution of our internal selves the way that the family's falling apart, the way we've left our forefathers' religion and taken up with pornography and drinking and God knows what all. <laughs> that the pollution out here is just a kind of a metaphor. It's sort of a reflection of the sewer <laughs> that is the inner life of many people. Blah, 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 blah. It's not sort of. It's not kind of. But the trick in that that I was trying to carry a little further is that there seems to be no doubt I mean, it doesn't seem to be open to any sort of question with ordinary consciousness that men have done things out here culturally, collectively, environmentally, that men did this. Nature did not pour sewerage in this river. Man did. Sometimes life makes me, I have to stop and internally I go, you know. <laughs> sometimes it's so good I even hesitate to get my follow-up to point out the missing dimension of this. I just want to leave it so beautiful it's like framing, it's like, you know, framing some dog shit you found on the street or something. <laughs> you think, well, it's so perfect in its own way, how can I add to it? I certainly can't distract from it. Beauty is beauty. I salute beauty wherever I see it. There can't be any question 
nature did not pour raw sewage in that river. We're standing here looking at it. We know where it came from. Man did it. They did not pour this mercury in the river. That plant, we see it. There comes the fire. Those people in that plant, that corporation did it. The, the officers of that corporation, the employees, man did this, not nature. So it is not genetic. <laughs> well, see, of course, well, here's another great place. You that's laughing, see if you can laugh at this. It's not simply it's done this so beautifully. Life has done this. It's done it so beautifully that me pointing it out, you can laugh at. <laughs> What's making you laugh? Is it the environment? Is it me pointing this out making you laugh? <laughs> All my descriptions of life having you in a slaughter queue, life misdirecting, that's not the reality. That's me describing it. I'm speaking in metaphors because anything you say is a metaphor. And anything you say that this doesn't seem to be open to any great uh, metaphorical interpretation to say that's a cup but the cup for me to say the cup everybody knows that's not the same thing as the cup or you should know it it's just life is arranged to get by to serve your purpose you can't stop and worry about such as that because in the city that's all the necessary energy and information same thing that needs to be cup well, hand me a cup you hand me a cup would you hand me a cup back there's your cup back Hey, don't step on the cup. I won't step on the cup. Don't drop your cup. I so you get by. Don't drink that cup that's got the poison, the purple cup. Don't drink that. Okay, I won't. You can drink a green. It all works. But to talk about anything, you have metaphoricalized it because you are not dealing directly with it. And consciousness is split in such a way to perception, to sight, the way I've described it to you that is metaphorically like human sight, remember, by focal consciousness. Which, of course, is not metaphorical like that. It's exactly like that. That's why people see like they do, but never mind that. You don't think, you don't think about that. That would give people a headache. <laughs> it's that everything in an individual, and only a few people can ever feel this to any degree, Everybody else feels like that there may be. They may get vibrated a little bit for somebody to point out that, you know what? Tyrannical governments are almost metaphorical for a certain type of individual. You know what I mean? The kind of people that, like, oh, you remember old Fred? And some people go, yeah, almost. And that's it. That's it. Only a few people can ever begin to feel that everything that seems to be metaphorical is not metaphorical. And the reason it seems that way, the reason it feels good, the reason it feels like it may be pregnant, that may be significant, may have further implications, the reason it feels that way is that you're looking through not a glass darkly, you're looking through a glass that's been cracked and then made very darkly and then lies behind it going. <laughs> Because there's nowhere else to look. There is no metaphor. It is not to say, it is not to simply ponder the rest of your life because you can pass for being intelligent to fall down in Rodin's pose and to think, you know what? The stuff he said about a car on a highway and the maps and people going around a beltway. God, is that a metaphor for life or not? No, it ain't. That is life. It's not a metaphor. But every mood every fear every dream every piece of architecture every book that's ever been written every witty phrase that's ever been turned all comes from the same place the same place <coughs> life's own genetic schematics its own schemes <laughs> Now let me take you back to where I was not before last. And I was using the apparent metaphor of people being automobiles, vehicles, motor vehicles, 
and people being on a highway and me suggesting to you most strongly that the highway ends up being a perimeter road around one place. And I was pointing out to you, if you recall, that to put it fairly crudely in words, that in earlier days, men and women, boys and girls, have the sensation that the importance in life, the future in life, the intrigue in life, the purpose of life, take your choice, is where the highway is going. And then gradually as you begin to grow up, and then as you get real grown up, it is as though you lose all interest, all faith, all ability to get excited, the energy to pursue that, and then you become gradually, and then finally almost in toto, concerned and interested in what appears to be the vehicle instead of the highway. How am I doing? Jesus, I've got a headache. You got a bag? Yeah. I had been to a doctor in two, you know, almost two days now. How am I? All right. That is such a good metaphor because, well, it's just such a good metaphor. But now let me see if I can drag you a few minutes away from the car and the highway because it's such a good metaphor that you can get stuck in the tar. All of ordinary existence. The conception that man has of himself and the conception that man has of his existence here can easily, properly, be divided into two descriptions that I was setting up with the highway and the car. His conception of himself, slash, his conception of life, is either on the basis of his plans or his condition, which is, no way of putting it, is where am I going or how am I doing? I've tried to hint at this over the last several months and refer to it as a kind of topographical curiosity should be ignited and people are properly attracted to this is why is it over and over I keep doing it and some of you should be able to do it in other areas that just strike you. That you come up with two possibilities. You divide up everything into this and that. It covers all immediately conceivable possibilities of interest and it's also the minimal description the minimal division in this case what else is there in ordinary life for you to think about for you to plan about for you to worry about for you to think about the whole attitude toward you being here and being alive and being a conscious human being what are the two areas in which you can interest yourself they're just there say so the where am I going my plans or how am I doing? What's my condition? That's it. Think about it a second. That's it. And further than that, life looked at extremes. People looked at extremes. You can see people whose only interest seems to be. It's really misnaming to ever say that anything's only. It's to give you some breathing room. But there are people, the world's full of them, that their only interest seems to be plans. Where is life going? People that seem to be, have no interest in introspection. I could point out to you, if we're going to use archetypical figures, the Attilas, the Neros, the men of action in history, the Alexanders. <coughs> deal with the Gordian knot, nobody can figure it out. He pulls out a sword, he cuts it in two. And he says, let's go. He solved it. That's it. Nothing to talk about. There are not only people like that. Then in you there are moods. Hours, days, but moods in which that seems to be your only interest is in plans. And of course, this seems to happen after you get past a certain age, I'll have to point out, it seems to happen thanks to external stimuli, a brand new lover, a new job, a new hobby, even a new book. And it's 
as though for hours, if not days, you can almost become unconscious of yourself. That you've gone hours or days and not worried about your blood pressure, your cholesterol level, the fact that your wife left you two weeks ago. It's now suddenly that you've got a new interest and it's plan, 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 plan. Then there are people. You've got to jump back over the metaphor again. Then there are people in life who seem to be almost entirely interested in their condition. The vehicle, not the highway. Never mind that. Classic cases. The naval meditators, perhaps even hermits, people who go cloister themselves away, and if they don't do that literally, the kind of people who seem to have almost <coughs> minimal connection with the outside world, people who never look around, people that sometimes I guess would be called extremely introverted by psychology, but people whose only concern seems to be, what's my condition? And what goes on out here is just of almost no concern. It's what is my condition? How am I doing? What am I thinking? What am I feeling? And their plans in life amount to that. In the same way, we're not just talking about people. Those correctly here involved with this, you have moods. You have hours, you have days, you have times, you have moods, wherein that seems to be your bill of fare that you're carried away, and it may again appear to be triggered by some external phenomenon that something did happen. You lost your job. You did have a negative report on some x-rays you had on your lungs. You have been spitting up blood, your cholesterol levels back up, whatever, and then you go for days or hours. You go for moods, and whatever your interest in life seem to be, your ordinary hobbies, your friends, like for hours or days, it's as though you have drifted away from that or cut it away and people are even concerned and it's as though you are sitting at home whether you are literally or not in a room by yourself and the whole thing is what's my condition how am i doing and it doesn't have to be just health now it can apparently be uh, an ill stroke of fate having to do with your job or your love life if you will try and feel if you can do it now that describes everything. The institutions of life, political parties, by all kinds of descriptions, religions, philosophies, whole areas of fattish feeling, nowadays would be lumped into psychology, I guess, yes. the general field, deal with one area almost exclusively or the other, but not both, and no overlapping. Yes. It's a clean division, as much as the two hemispheres of the brain, as much as your two eyes are separated and can look at two different things, is the apparent interest, the possibility that one interest can be described fully, but at minimally it must be this, but also fully is that you can be interested in where the road's going. You can be interested in plans in life. You can be interested in where am I going or, and this, the next one's going to cover every other thing the first one didn't catch. Or you got to be interested in the vehicle. Never mind the highway. Never mind any kind of destination. The important thing is, I am. I was born in this damn car. I'm stuck here. My interest is in the car, the noises, the condition, the humidity, the music coming over the radio, where the windshield is clean, where the seat is comfortable. Never mind the highway. The importance is my condition. How am I doing? Not where am I going? And those two cover it. Not only do they cover it adequately, but any less would not cover it. You've got to have the two. We've got to turn the tape over. Go ahead.
to continue giving descriptions and words on this basis, to do this, or a real revolutionist have got to merge these two. The real revolution has got to understand, got to see, got to understand, and got to remember, not only can they be merged and must be merged, they are in fact the same thing. Your condition is your plans. Your plans are your condition. Now, all right, you want me to stop a second and point out that I can say, all right, since we can describe, even people in the city could hear this, that a human's only got two general ways to look at himself and the possible nature of life and purpose. He can either involve himself and interest himself in possible plans. That is, what can I do? Where am I going in life? The other possibility is, how am I doing? What's my condition? How do I feel? What do I think? And that's it. And even people in the city go, yeah, that's true. All right, not only must they be merged, you've got to see they're the same. And people in the city, I could say, all right, in a sense, people in the city, they're the same. And people in the city's brain would go, oh, no, no, no. No, no. If they were the same, they wouldn't be different. There wouldn't be two <laughs> possibilities. And I'd say, wait a minute, city brains, wait a minute, city brains, trust me here, trust me here, listen to me a second. When I said they're the same, of course, I didn't mean they're literally the same, I meant that they are metaphorically kind of the same. And the city brains, the city brains, some of them go, well, wait a minute, I'll suspend judgment, go ahead. And I'd say, all right, think about this. A man's plans in life, and the city brains go, yeah, yeah, yeah. A man's plans in life could be seen as a metaphor for his condition. And the city brain say, well, well, well. And I say, all right, like this. A man who is, let's say, sick at heart. A man who is continually depressed. He's been heartbroken. Uh, kind of embittered by life. And the city brain go, yeah, 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 we dig that. So, all right, do you understand his plans? The way he perceives the possibilities, what he might do in life, is almost a metaphor for that because they're going to, his plans, his dreams are going to be possibly severely colored by this inner kind of bitterness. And so his plans, he's going to kind of look at life as being a bad trip. There's not really, no great possibility he's going to have any very agreeable plans. And some of the city brains go, wow, is that, meta is that metaphorical or not? So if there's any purpose I'm pointing out, I could almost do that in the city. Notice, part of, again, it's life behind the mirror going, because you go, yeah, it's true, it's always a metaphor. And if you don't watch it, then we can just leave it there. Or you leave it there, like, huh, boy, that's weird. I'll write it down and think about it some more and see if I see some more connections. <laughs> they're not any more connections because there's not any connections to begin with. You know, one is not connected with anything. You know, that's not connected with anything. When you put a, a wet spot in the air, there is no connection between a man's condition and his plans. There's no connection. They're the same thing. But as long as it seems like, well, wait a minute, there could be a connection. In fact, you're right. The way you described it, you can see one of them as being metaphorically a reflection of the other. I just did that. I just did that to show you that it can be done, and it sounds right, and it will stop everything. It apparently brings about a fairly conclusive statement. That, yeah, you're right. A man's condition affects the possible plans he can make. Of course, and see, they do that, and they say, that's not bad. You're pretty sharp. I didn't think you'd be able to pull that off, but you're right. Ha! You about through? Because <laughs> they, they can feel like, well, that was worthwhile. You made me see a metaphorical connection. And as long as you see a metaphorical connection, you, can, you won't see that they're the same thing. Does nobody want to salute and go... That's what I meant earlier. It's not as crude as life saying up is down and black is white. It's like life says, no, nah, black is not white, but black is almost gray. It, sometimes black is almost, not the opposite of white, black is almost a metaphor for white. <laughs> up, up, up sometimes is almost a parable for down, and people go, Jesus, is that something or not? <laughs> and you feel as though you have accomplished something. I have learned something. I have studied and learned something new. And what you learned was for life to go, hey, look. <laughs>
As long as you believe that things may be a metaphor for something else, you won't see that they are the same thing. And I picked this specifically where it seems to fly at the speed of light tonight or not with you individually. I picked these examples for a specific reason that a man's condition, his feeling about how am I doing, what, what shape am I in, and then where am I going? Because it can seem to be such a metaphor that it seems to be unconditionally true that a man's attitude, his dreams about where I might go, are absolutely connected. It's got to be with his condition. A sick man can't have happy dreams. A depressed person cannot imagine plans of a positive nature. I mean, it just seems obvious. A revolutionist somewhere would go, yeah, that's too damn obvious to suit me. Which is what I've been trying to do to some of you people for a year now. That yes, that is so obvious, that is so clear, that is such a metaphor that it stinks. I'm tired of being fooled by this shit. If it's, if it's that good a metaphor, it means one thing. It means there is no metaphor. It's the same thing. But notice, by any ordinary effort, you, you can see that, yes, a man's plans could be seen as a metaphor, seen as connected with his condition. I can see that. But can you see further? There's no need to see further. Hell, it took effort to see that far. Because at first it sounded like two different things, but after you talked a while, and I used my, some of my brilliance, I realized that, yeah, there could be some possible connection. Yeah, keep going. Well, hell, I've arrived. I saw that. I could see that a man's condition could be affected by his plans. A man who has, let's start there then, a man who seems to be, from an early age, happy dreams. He believes that he's here to help humanity and that something good is going to happen to him. Those kind of people, they've got statistics. Somebody does to show this. Those kind of people with a good attitude seem to be sick less often. They seem to be less depressed. People that believe they wake up every morning whistling and think, well, you know, sure, I got a job sweeping up after the elephants in the circus, but well, at least I'm in show business, and I'm sure, that, I'm sure that someday the ringmaster, God forbid, will get sick, and they'll say, who can go on? And I'll go, and I'll, I'll be discovered, and I'll be it. That kind of person gets up every day. Everybody else has got a cold. The flu's going through the whole circus. This one guy pushing the broom behind the elephants, always happy because he, he has happy plans. He has good plans, and therefore it keeps him well. There's statistics <laughs> to prove that. So I can say, all right, there's got to be some kind of connection, right? And nowadays, I'm sure that the country and the world is full of psychologists and psychiatrists who say, well, you're behind the times. We know that. That you can see a, man's, a man that has happy dreams, you can see that as being a, a metaphorical statement. It's even a, a diagnosis. If you just tell me a man's plans, if you could give me his dreams and plans and they were happy enough, I wouldn't have to examine. I could tell you that guy's going to have blood pressure within the acceptable limits. His cholesterol is probably going to be down. He's never going to get an ulcer. Probably doesn't have headaches because those happy plans has some kind of connection with his condition. No, they don't. They are his condition. No, no. They got, I guess metaphorically, yeah. No, 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 no. They are his condition. It is arranged, you should be able to see this more and more clearly, by life that men cannot see where things overlap. They cannot merge these appropriate, these necessary divisions. The brains, the eyes, the consciousness of man sees everything is split into two. That you've got to have it. You can't have a one-sided coin. It just does not fit in a 3D universe. There's no way you can even imagine it. There's no such thing as a one-sided coin. There's no such thing as a one-sided idea, a one-sided feeling, a one-sided opinion, a one-sided way to live. Everybody's got an adversary. Everybody has got a, an, a foe. Everybody has got a form of government that interferes with theirs. Everybody has an economic policy and theory that is in direct conflict with somebody else. Everybody believes whether they use my terms or not, of course, that you've got two ways to feel and to think about life. That is, where I might be going, and the other way is, how am I doing? What kind, what's my condition? 
the highway or the vehicle. There is a point, it's real close, although it's, some of you may think, well, hell, it took you a year or more to tell me this. No, it didn't, but if you hear it tonight, go ahead and blame it on me. <laughs> the truth is, it took you a year to hear it. No, I'll take the blame. You can't really go anywhere as long as you are tied to that form of life's genetic code, that there are these divisions, that there is heredity and there is environment. There is the way that nature created things, and then there is the things that man has done post-nature. There is an in here, an inner life of me that only I know is private. We won't go into what kind of condition it's in, but there is an inner life in me, and then there's a life out here. There is I, and then there's not I. You could look since this doesn't have a name or since I won't give it one, you could look at this, a fair working description of what this kind of activity is. It is a struggle against life arranging things in such a way that men ordinarily cannot merge alternatives. They cannot see that alternatives are not alternatives. Alternatives are the same thing. <laughs> but that you could not have had the thing in consciousness to begin with had it not had an alternative. You can't have a cup unless you've got everything else in the world that's not a cup. And this is not some redoing I'm trying to do of freshman logic or psychology or philosophy. It is a simple fact. This cup can't be identified unless it's got an alternative. There's got to be a not cup. There's got to be the podium. There's got to be my finger to point. There's got to be. Language would not operate. The nervous system would not operate and come out as being conscious, as it's called at our level without there being alternatives to everything. For everything that you can think of, there's got to be that which that thing is not. For every feeling you have, that is the nature of the nervous system. That is the nature of the electrical basis, the chemical basis, which is harder to see, but that is the basis of the nervous system operating and being alive at this level. Everything is seen as having an alternative, not simply an opposite. That's the easy way to talk about it, but everything has got to be seen as having an alternative that you can either concern yourself over you or you could concern yourself over not you, the plans of life, trying to do something, trying to go somewhere, trying to accomplish something out there or else spend your time worrying about you, your condition, the shape you're in, not just physically but in all aspects. As long as you're, t and you can vacillate between the two, as I was saying, you people have got to have that ability. Everybody's got some of it, but you've got to have that real ability. But if you are still tied to that, you'll never move. It is like this. You go through a period that you're worried about the highway, and your interest stays focused on the highway, and as long as you're in that condition, the highway's going nowhere, going around and around. Or you fall back into the other possible area that you seem to be concerned there in your car, you almost become oblivious to the highway, which everybody should know that shows you the real purpose, or the demanding purpose of consciousness, that you can drive blind <laughs> for days, days and days and days. Some people live blind for years. But you can drive blind and go for hours, weeks, that apparently all you're concerned about is hearing the noises in the car, bitching about the lack of an FM radio, bitching about the scratchy up holster in the car, listening for noises, watching smoke come out from under the car, that you apparently go for all this long periods of time that you're apparently caught up into what's my condition, not where am I going. As long as you're in that condition, in that position, you can't change. You have got to, I'll describe it as a two-step program since everybody likes the two-step, except for those of you whose name is Strauss, of course. It's first off, you have got to merge the two. You got to merge the two that just, which, if you can do that, the merging takes, well, I guess it takes longer than to uh, split the atom. But anyway, as soon as you can merge the two, then you can go right immediately to step two, which is to understand that there were no alternatives to start with, that the alternatives were the same thing. That's why they're alternatives. They've got to be the same thing. Heads and tails have got to be the same coin or they're not heads and tails. 
up and down is the same direction, or you couldn't get from one, you couldn't compare them. There would be no alternative. There would be no highway without the vehicle. There'd be no vehicle without a highway. <laughs> You'd have no plans if you didn't have some condition. If you weren't in some kind of shape, you wouldn't have any plans. <laughs> but if it weren't for there being plans, you wouldn't be in any kind of shape. There would be no condition of you. Yeah, I guess they do have some possible metaphorical connection. None, none, none. That's why they seem so agreeably connected metaphorically. It's because they have none. They're the same thing. Well, no, uh, that can't be. That's pretty slick, but no. Now, some things are not metaphorical, but those that are shows that there is some possible connection. Some things lend themselves to metaphorical thinking. True. If you're simply stuck at the level of thinking. If you can only see something, two alternatives, two things, two aspects, something in here, your condition, then something out there, the institutions, the workings of culture, the cult workings of man's civilization. If just periodically you see some possible connection between in here and out there, then you've got to see continually that life is at best a metaphorical reflection of me, or sometimes maybe vice versa. And you are stuck, you got your choice. You're stuck on that highway or you're stuck in that vehicle forever. And you can't move. Oh, I know apparently the vehicle moves somewhere, but you go in a circle. You go around the beltway over and over, but you don't really move. All right, sometimes I think I'm going somewhere else. Yeah, but you don't like the car then. That's true. <laughs> Nobody finds that highly suspicious. Not highly Selassie, but highly suspicious. <laughs> Well, it's hard to be straightforward. No, it's not. No, no, no. I shouldn't lie to you on a Friday. I mean, even indirectly.